A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord God is the maker of them all. Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. This is the word of the Lord. Let's talk about wealth. I want to tell you the story of uh, from a, a little book by Dennis and Matthew Lynn called Sleeping with Bread. And after the Second World War, there were thousands of orphans in Europe. They uh, had been living on the streets. They didn't have enough to eat. And they were, they were in a bad state. They, they couldn't sleep at night, even after they were housed and safe. And someone discovered that if they gave each child a piece of bread to sleep with at night, they were able to sleep because for them, the message of the bread is, I have enough for today and I'm going to eat again tomorrow. So my question for you today is, have you ever been afraid of running out of something? Have you ever been afraid of running out of money before the end of the month? Or running out of time before the end of that deadline? or running out of gas. I ran out of gas once on Queen Street. I was just like spitting distance from being able to roll into the Petro Canada, but the fumes in my car had completely run out and I couldn't get there. Um, have you ever, during COVID, did you hoard uh, toilet paper? Because everybody was afraid of running out. There's a guy in the Old Testament who is famous for his ability to accumulate stuff. His name was Solomon, and during his lifetime, he accumulated more gold, more silver, more palaces, more horses, more chariots, more everything than anyone could ever use in their lifetime. And at the end of his life, he uh, was reflecting on how he had accumulated all of this stuff, and yet he was no happier, he was no better off in terms of meaning than any one of his subjects. So he was known for his wealth and he was also known for his wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, our, um, Solomon was said to have written 3,000 Proverbs, 800 that we have still. There are 900 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. And if you ever want to find some real wisdom for how to live, that's the book to go to. In the book of Proverbs, he, um, he gives us three ways to be wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. I cannot guarantee it would ever buy you a house in the GTA, but it will make you wealthy. And the first one from Proverbs 22 is, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means you already have a reputation. You have a reputation in your family. You have a reputation at work. You have a reputation in this church. In this church, I only have to say the words Bruce South, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, we know that guy's reputation. Try getting in here without being welcomed in a friendly way. He's going to be right on you in a wonderful way. Um, it may, you know, your name and your reputation mean something. And Proverbs say that it's, it's worth protecting. It's more valuable than your pin number. And your name means something. In Proverbs, your wealth, your net worth is your reputation and your name. And what you get in return for that, Proverbs says, that the result of a good reputation and a good name is favor. So what's favor? Well, imagine this. What if when you ask somebody else for help, they said yes to you? Um, you, didn't, you don't have to bribe them. You don't have to nag them. You don't have to threaten them. You don't have to offer to include them in your will. You know, the fish fry that was here at St. Paul's on Friday night um, I think there were 
hundreds of volunteer hours easily. Uh, I can guess that there were a good $10,000 worth of volunteer labor and management that was donated to do this. Uh, and and you got to ask, what made all of those people wash floors and set tables and scrape fish skins and do dishes at the end of it all? Like, how do you make Bob and Kathy take something on like that? Like, what in the world were they thinking? <laughs> you may have been asking that after Friday night, too. Um, you know, it's favor. And how valuable is favor? It's wealth. I mean, it's something that that God gives you from the goodness of God lived out in you towards others. Other people want to help you. And the second way that the Proverbs say that you can accumulate wealth, and I know this is counterintuitive, and I want to tell you a story from when Doug and I were students. I don't like to tell the good stories because I have so many bad examples <laughs> to share. But in, in this case, um, Doug and I, for the first two years we were married, we were both students full-time. And the way the church was set up at the time, um, during the school year, we had to do unpaid internships. So I wasn't free to take on a part-time job. And over the summer, they sent us on summer internships that were so remote that only the person who was assigned the internship could work and draw a salary. The other one couldn't work. And the punchline is that through the school year, we had to live on our savings all the way through to the end of the last semester and, um, and into the period where until we got our first paycheck. So the money had to last. And I got to tell you, I was anxious about that. I was so frugal that I'm afraid to even tell you the stories. <laughs> But I can tell you that one pound of, of stewing beef can, can eke out for at least four meals, sometimes eight. Anyways, I know this sounds like a, I walked to school 10 miles in the, in the snow, uphill, both ways kind of story. But it, it was true. So on my internship during the school year, there was actually another clergy couple who were worse off than we were. And it was... In the uh, late spring, we were getting towards the end of, in, end of the school year, maybe early spring. And I really felt impressed that the Holy Spirit was saying to give them some money. And I told Doug about this, and he agreed. And I know this isn't logical, but we put a bit of money in an envelope, and we found a way to get it to them anonymously, and... You know, they felt it was an answer to prayer, and, and we were really so happy to be a part of that. And three things came out of that. The first is that we ran out of money before the end of the year, and in our last month, we didn't have the money to cover rent. And by a miracle, somebody who didn't know anything about this sent us money, and we were able to pay our rent and, and get through to um, our next paycheck. <coughs> The second thing, that, 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 rather the third thing that happened is that when we did this, the real miracle is for some reason I stopped being anxious. And uh, if you know me, that really was a miracle. And Proverbs 22, 9 says, Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. And I think this is what it meant. If you have just enough for you, you have just enough for you. But if you have just enough for today, and you have something that you can give away to someone else who needs it, then you have a surplus. And if you have a surplus, then you have wealth. You're wealthy. Jesus, one life to live in a mortal body. He gave it away on the cross for our sake. And God raised him from the dead and gave him the name that is above all other names. How could he do that? I could name a church whose name you would recognize who are probably the wealthiest church per capita in the entire country. And I can tell you one thing about the givers in that church. They're cheap. Per capita, you little St. Pauls are way ahead of them. Because wealth doesn't make a person generous. 
Generosity is what makes a person wealthy. So what is wealth? Well, first of all, wealth is a good name and a reputation that gives us favor with other people. Second thing, wealth is generosity, especially to someone who cannot pay you back. And, and especially if you can do it in a way that you are not the center of it, but there's a way of giving it to another person. So it's not about you as the giver. It's about their dignity as the person receiving. And one more. The Proverbs say, do not rob the poor because they are poor. And do not crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause and despoils them, those who despoil them. And that has two meanings. The first one is obvious. You know, sometimes you are going to be in a position of authority or a position of power, and you can make somebody do what you want them to do. And the first interpretation is just, like, don't be a jerk. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And people who are naturally strong really have to learn gentleness in dealing with other people because you can roll right over them like a steamroller and never even know what you hit. The second is this. Sometimes you're going to see a real injustice. And you're going to see somebody being bullied or pushed around. And you are going to be that person who is in a position to say something or to do something about it. It takes a certain kind of courage, but really pay attention if the Holy Spirit nudges you to say or to do something. You can change the course of somebody's life. There was a Christian monk by the name of Telemachus. He was known as a holy man. He spent a lot of his time in the wilderness praying, but early in um, the year 404 AD, he came into Rome. And at that time, Rome was already, at least by reputation, a Christian city, but they were still holding gladiator games in the arena, fights to the death. And the, the problem was the games were big business, and over the years, people had developed a tolerance for violence. And unless there was blood and death, people really weren't entertained anymore. So on January 1st, 404, there were big games held in the Colosseum in celebration of averting a military tragedy. Alaric the Goth had been marching into Rome and he'd been stopped. Telemachus went into the arena. He saw the games and the blood and he thought, this is just wrong. So he jumped into the arena, onto the Colosseum floor, 80,000 spectators all around, and he shouted, stop this. This has to stop. And he actually put himself between two of the gladiators. And the crowd was not happy at having their entertainment interrupted. And they yelled at him, shut up, get out of there. And finally, the director of the games made a signal, and one of the gladiators took his sword, shoved it through Telemachus. Telemachus lay dead on the ground in the sand of the Colosseum. And all 80,000 people went silent to see this holy man lying dead. Historians tell us that the games in Rome ended abruptly that day, never to begin again. Now, it's highly unlikely that you're ever going to be called to do something that drastic. And I'm not advocating you go out and do something really stupid and risky. But don't underestimate the good you can do by interrupting evil. And don't underestimate the evil that you can end by doing good. That's wealth. Wealth is a good name that, and reputation that leads to favor. Generosity makes you wealthy. Wealth does not make you generous. And third way of being wealthy, accumulating wealth, is use whatever position and influence God has given you for good. 
God will give you the opportunity to do good. And if that, when that happens, you will be wealthier than Elon Musk. And you can take that wealth with you into eternity. And you can leave the world a richer place.